Hi. Sea turtles have been on the planet for over 70 million years. They swam in the ocean while the dinosaurs were going extinct. They've seen climate change, natural disasters, various predators, major shifts in nesting beach habitat. This ancient reptile has adapted to an evolving planet for millennia. Yet in recent decades, they struggle to coexist with a superior predator, us. This is Archelon, a fossil that was discovered in South Dakota in 1895. Shallow seas covered the central North American continent. It most closely resembles the sea turtles that we have today. In particular, the leatherback sea turtle. The leatherback is the largest of the seven species, and it's the only one with a leathery shell. And we presume that Archelon also had a leathery shell. It weighed in at over 3,000 pounds. It's 16 feet wide and 13 feet long. Everything was bigger back then. But the leatherback is no small turtle. It weighs in on average at 1,000 pounds, but the largest one we've ever discovered in 1988 in Wales was over 2,000 pounds. Its shell was nine feet long, so it was 11 feet overall. That turtle, I'm assuming, is over 100 years old because reptiles have indeterminate growth, which means they grow as long as they live. I'm also going to assume that an animal that has been on the planet for millions of years has become such a fixture that without its support, the framework of the ocean environment would suffer a significant blow. We don't know exactly what that is, but it cannot be good. Man has the ability to create unnatural things. We have spinning blades through the water to push our boats. We have major concrete structures on the beach encroaching on nesting beach habitat. We have plastics that resemble food sources on the ocean floor. Artificial lights that confuse hatchlings when they come out of their nests. We have fishing line, hooks, and nets that entangle sea turtles and they drown. Our theme is resilience. Sea turtles have accomplished and conquered extreme odds until now. But the pace with which we create change is too fast for them to keep up. We started paying attention in the early 60s when sea turtles are washing up dead on South Carolina beaches with no apparent injuries, having drowned in shrimp nets. The sea turtle soup industry was having trouble keep, keeping up with the t demand. And this is Key West in 1961. They are processing green sea turtles here. In the late 60s, we had some laws in place that would protect sea turtles to a certain extent. But in December of 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed. All six that are in our waters have been on that list for my entire existence. I was born seven months after that. So for my entire existence, six out of the seven species have been on the list. The seventh species is not on the list because it's the Australian flatback, and it only lives in Australia. It's out of our jurisdiction. 44 years later, we have made some improvements. Most beaches have nest monitoring programs in place. We have beachfront lighting ordinances in effect, May through October. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., exterior lights off. This is your floodlight. Doesn't mean you have to go to bed at 10 p.m. Just means you have to bring the shades closed so that no light is visible from the beach. When a hatchling comes out of its nest, it looks for the brightest light. And the brightest light is always going to be a floodlight over the glow of the moon. So they end up in your swimming pools, under your decks, behind the dune, and they perish. We lost 32 nests on Hilton Head to beachfront lighting this season. The sea turtle excluder device is required in all shrimp nets in the United States. It was enforced in the early 90s in South Carolina. It's a big metal contraption that's sewn into the net with bars vertically down the center. The fish and the crab and the shrimp go through the bars and they end up in the sock of the net. The sea turtle hits the bars and is forced down with the current of the boat pulling the net and it's ejected out of the hole in the bottom to, to breathe another day. Major, major improvement in the fishing industry here. We encourage beachgoers to use a red flashlight on their beach walks. That red wavelength is not as distracting to a sea turtle as white light is. So if you have to have a light on the beach, color it with a Sharpie if it's not red. Red is all we need. 
Hole Patrol. If you haven't heard of Hole Patrol, it was on the front page of the Island Packet at some point this past season. It's a group that gets together in the evenings, residents and high school students fulfilling service hours. They fill in holes at the end of the day. And every year the holes get deeper. I'm not sure why you need a four foot hole at the beach, but when a hatchling comes out of the sand and walks down to the water in the dark, it falls into the hole and does not get out. Beaufort County is being encouraged to put a ban on the single use plastic bag. The problem with this particular item of plastic is that it, it's airy, it flies, just like a balloon. So when it is caught in the wind and flies over the ocean, it lands on the water and submerges. It looks just like a jellyfish moving through the water. That's a main food source for the leatherback sea turtle. And once it's ingested, it clogs the intestines and it is fatal. So in my world, that plastic bag ban would be an excellent contribution to the conservation of sea turtles. Off the beach and on the water, we have fishermen reeling in that big fish and at the end of their line, it's not a fish. Didn't expect that, it's a sea turtle. They usually swallow the hook. In the good old days, we just cut the line and say, oh, it'll rust out. Not so much causes a lot of damage in the meantime. So if you know the hotline to call, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources will call a volunteer, probably me, and I'll meet you at the boat landing and transport that turtle to the South Carolina Aquarium in Charleston, where they will surgically remove that hook, rehabilitate the turtle, and release it. We had three hook swallowers this season. Boaters neglect to slow down during the nesting season. Sea turtles are congregating near shore. They're waiting for their opportunity to approach the beach in the dark to deposit their eggs. So May through October, we're gonna have that concentration. My job, my stranding position, I go to these turtles that have been struck, I measure them, I take pictures, I take a genetic sample, I pit tag scan them, speciate them, sex them, and supply all of that information for the Department of Natural Resources, and they will collect that and be able to keep track of our population. Maybe individuals will take out of their catalog, and we will know how these sea turtles are dying. I dig the hole also, and bury them. That's the hard part. Sometimes they wash up debilitated, and when they do, we need to pay attention. This is a message from the ocean. They are a keystone species, which means they are near the top of the food chain. And when they are sick, we can assume there's something going on down here. It could be obvious, like plastics lodged in their intestines, or it could be more vague, like fertilizers bioaccumulating in sea grasses, which is a main food source for the green sea turtle. We believe that that contamination of their food source is causing a disease called fibropapillomatosis. It's a herpes virus rampant in the green sea turtle population. It manifests itself as warts on the outside of their soft tissue, covers their eyes, makes it hard for them to swim. It's also internal and disrupts their organ function. This guy was the 30th stranding on Hilton Head in 2017. He washed up in the Harbortown Yacht Basin just two weeks ago. Unfortunately, his disease was too far advanced for rehabilitation. He did make it to the hospital, but uh, that was as far as he got. Have you ever had that moment in your life when you know that you look back on it, you know if you hadn't had that experience that you wouldn't be the same person that you are today? I feel fortunate that I have had that experience. When I was in my early 20s, I worked on a dive boat that ran out of Hilton Head Harbor, and our destination was 16 miles offshore, the Eagle's Nest wreckage. My job as the dive master was to help the divers into the water, get them back out of the water, and then dive back down to the wreck to remove the anchor from the wreckage and set it in the sand so the crew could easily pull it up. It was also my five minutes of diving, all I could afford. So on this particular day, I was just looking around, and out of the depths, a large shadow is approaching. And being the age that I was, I was lack of fear, lack of experience, stood there to wait and see what it was. Fortunately, it was a sea turtle. I'd never seen one in the water, but I could tell what it was. It's, if you've ever seen it, it looks like a bird flying in slow motion. It is graceful in its element, just beautiful. So I stood very still, waiting to see if it would just get close enough for me to get a good look at it. Not only did it get close enough, it would have headbutted me 
if I had not rolled back on my heels and lay on the ocean floor while it hovers over me like a spacecraft. Talk about impressed. That turtle was 10 feet long in all directions as water magnifies. <laughs> so when I made my way up that rope, that line, snot, tears filling my mask, I get back on the boat, the boys notice, of course, and make fun of me. And normally I would have let them have it, but on this particular day, I was speechless. They knew I was serious. I was changed forever. I knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life. 19 years later, a master's degree in marine biology with a focus on sea turtle biology, by the way, the most non-lucrative field you can possibly imagine. <laughs> And I managed the Sea Turtle Protection Project for Hilton Head Island. Thousands of volunteer hours spent on nesting beaches for sea turtle conservation. I am still inspired by sea turtles. I have had the privilege of being in their presence while they're swimming, while they're laying their eggs in the sand, while they're hatching, and while they're taking their last breaths. And when I see them, I see that turtle that, I, that chose me, that changed my life forever. So I hope that you will consider your impact on the ocean environment. Here's your list again. Lights out beachfront. If you're staying there, just turn those non-essential exterior lights off. Red lights on your beach walk. Fill your holes. How simple is that? Responsible boating and know that hotline to call if you find an injured turtle or you reel it in at the end of your line. Keep those plastics off the beach, and if you can, use your canvas bags at the grocery store. I know it's hard to remember. I've had to go back to the car and get them or just forget the bag and carry each thing out individually. I have done that before. Sea turtles have been on the planet for over 70 million years. But in a matter of decades, we have totally diminished their population to a point where they could go extinct. We need to pay attention. Will we continue to act irresponsibly for the sake of convenience? Or will you help me consider these suggestions that I'm giving? Be proactive. Implement them for the health of our sea turtle population to promote their existence for the next generation to be inspired. On behalf of all sea turtles nesting on Hilton Head, thank you. <laughs>